What is up, everybody? JT Sports here. Back to you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast. And on this episode, I'm here with my 2022 NFL record predictions for the AFC West division. For those of you guys who are new listeners of the podcast and you don't know how to do my record predictions, we don't go game by game or week by week. The reason for this is because I don't want people to focus on who I have beating who. I want people to focus on the overall record prediction. So I give out my best case scenario, what's the ceiling, what if everything goes right, my worst case scenario, what's the floor for if everything goes left, and then I give you guys my overall record prediction, how I feel said team will perform this season. Now, if this is your first time listening to the JT Sports Podcast, welcome i appreciate you for tuning in make sure that you follow me on all of my social media platforms you can follow me on twitter at jt sports underscore underscore and on instagram at jt sports underscore lastly make sure that you check out the jt sports podcast i normally don't upload full segments of the pod on youtube normally i just upload segments so if you want to consistently listen to full episodes in their entirety you have to check out the audio version of the podcast available on every single podcasting service apple podcast spotify google wherever you get your podcast from the jt sports podcast is available all you got to do is go down to the pin comment section or the description down below and it will take you directly to it lastly make sure that you are subscribed to the youtube channel if you haven't already the Denver Broncos last season finished in last place in the AFC West with a record of 7-10. and Now, coaching and quarterback play is what held this team back in 2021. So, you hire Nathaniel Hackett as your new head coach, and he has a lot of promise. This is somebody who is a player's coach. Players love to play for him. They always have good things to say about him, but... I don't know how good he is as a play caller because remind you the last time Nathaniel Hackett called plays was during his time with the Jacksonville Jaguars and outside of that long year when the Jacksonville Jaguars went to the AFC championship game and they lost to the New England Patriots his offenses in Jacksonville haven't been all that great so in Denver He wants to have a explosive offense that takes a lot of chances down the field. And you bring in Russell Wilson in a trade with the Seattle Seahawks, who happens to be one of the best deep ball throwers in the NFL. Now, a good amount of people out there think that Russell Wilson has regressed. Now, even if you are one of those people, I still think that we can all agree with the fact that Russell Wilson is still a top 10 quarterback. And if you don't think that Russell Wilson is a top 10 quarterback, then I don't really know what to tell you. But I don't think he has regressed that much to the point that you shouldn't view him as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL still. In Seattle, he never really had a good offensive line. Yeah, he had a pretty good core receivers to throw to, but with him being on the Broncos now... I think that this is the most talented team that he has played with and over the last couple of seasons because Denver's offensive line is okay. I don't think it's great, but it's not bad. It could go either way. Either this offensive line is going to play really well or it's going to play pretty bad. I don't really think there's going to be an in-between. Now, you look at the running back position. I love Javante Williams. I think he's going to have a breakout season. You still do have Melvin Gordon back there. He's also going to be a factor, but I expect Javante Williams to get the bulk load of the carries by the midway point of this season. The YSU position is absolutely loaded. You got Tim Patrick. You have Cortland Sutton, who a lot of people really sleep on because Cortland Sutton wasn't really utilized all that much in this offense like he should have been because you had Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback and Teddy Bridgewater as we already know is a quarterback who doesn't take a lot of shots downfield so with Russell Wilson at the helm I think that a lot of people are now going to start to realize just how good 
Cortland Sutton is. He's one of the most talented wide receivers in the game. You also have Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy, this is somebody who was a former first round pick out of Alabama. He's one of the best route runners in the league. If he can stay healthy, I think he also could be in for a really monster season. So my best case scenario for the Denver Broncos this year is going to be 12 and 5. The defense should still be pretty good. Even if it does take a slight step back, I don't think they're going to go from one of the best defenses in the NFL to one of the worst. Even though they lost Vic Vangio, they do bring in a defensive coordinator who comes from that coaching tree who's pretty much going to run the same defense that Fangio ran so I still think that this defense at worst should be top 15 but I'm expecting this to still be a top 10 defense somewhere around that range between 7 and 10 offensively this offense should be able to put up a lot of points it should be really efficient because the fact that you're going to have a really solid run game and also the fact that once you get that run game going you're going to be able to stretch the field by utilizing play action so if everything goes right the offensive line plays good the defense doesn't take a major step back and Russell Wilson continues to be the Russell Wilson that we have seen over the last couple of years and he doesn't continue to regress the way that many people feel that he has over the last couple of seasons I think that the Broncos could be one of the best teams in the AFC and maybe they they potentially could win this division now my worst case scenario is going to be 6 and 11 and you may ask JT, why is the floor so low for you on the Denver Broncos? You know, why do you think that Denver potentially could only win six games? Well, like I mentioned earlier, the offensive line is either going to be really good or it's going to be below average. And I think in this division, if you're trying to have a shot at winning this thing, you have to be able to have consistent offensive line play week in and week out. I don't know if this offensive line is going to give you that. Another thing is that Nathaniel Hackett hasn't proved that he is a good play caller. During his time in Jacksonville, outside of that long, good season that they had, his offenses have been average at best. And you can say, well, JT, he had Blake Bortles at quarterback. He didn't really have a lot of talent in Jacksonville. I can understand that. But I still think that the jury is out on just how good of a play caller Nathaniel Hackett is. And to be quite honest with you, I don't really think that he's all that great. Now, it does help that he does have Russell Wilson as his quarterback. And if you have an elite quarterback, he's going to make the play caller look really good because he can turn a bad play into a good play. But I do feel that there are going to be some games that the Broncos are going to be in And Broncos fans are going to say, you know, what was up with that play call? You get what I'm saying? So 6-11 and is my worst case scenario simply for the fact that Nathaniel Hackett is unproven as a play caller. And we don't know just how consistent this offensive line is going to be. Now the defense, I'm not really worried about. I think their defense is pretty solid. I don't think that their defense is going to be the reason why things could end up going left. However, my overall record prediction for the Broncos this season is going to be 7-10. and 10. Now, I may be overanalyzing the Denver Broncos a little bit too much. Maybe I'm not giving Nathaniel Hackett enough credit as a play caller, but I'm somebody who I have to see it to believe it, okay? I've got burnt in the past by teams who have hired first-year head coaches who haven't been play callers in the past, for the team that they previously were on the staff of and with the Green Bay Packers Nathaniel Hackett was really just responsible for you know helping with the game plan he didn't really have that much of a role in the Green Bay Packers offense when it came to play calling duties it also helps with the fact that Green Bay also had Aaron Rodgers at the helm at quarterback and I don't want to compare him to Adam Gase but you got to remember When Adam Gates was calling the plays as the OC for Denver, he had Peyton Manning. And then he became the head coach of the Miami Dolphins, and their offense was never better than maybe above average one season. So for Nathaniel Hackett, you know, 
With him calling plays in Jacksonville, that still is in my head. And you may say, JT, that was a long time ago. You got to get over that. I understand that. But that's the last time we've seen him as a play caller. Now, of course, he's probably going to tweak some things. He's going to make some adjustments because he's going to have a way better personnel on offense compared to what he had during his time with the Jaguars. But... I'm just not really all that big of a believer in Nathaniel Hackett when it comes to the play calling, and I think that's what's going to hold the Denver Broncos back this season. That's why I have them at 7-10. and 10. And of course, you can say that I'm overanalyzing Denver. I'm not saying that they're going to be a bad team. I just feel that they're going to have some games in there that they're going to end up losing. And you're going to say, dang, like, how did they lose to this team? Similar to the L.A. Chargers last year. Remember when they had that surprising loss against the Houston Texans late into the year and everybody was like, how did they lose to the Texans? I think you're going to see a couple of games in there that the Denver Broncos are going to lose late in the season to teams that, you know, they would be favored to beat. And I think that's what's going to cost them. I still think that this team is going to be fairly competitive. I just think that, you know, with the fact that Nathaniel Hackett hasn't really proven to be an effective play caller, I think that's what's going to hold the Broncos back this season. That's why I have them at 7-10. and Last season, Kansas City won the AFC West for a sixth straight season in a row. They went 12-5, and five and they lost to the Cincinnati Bengals in the AFC Conference Championship game. Now, there are a good amount of people out there who believe that the Kansas City Chiefs are just going to take this major step back, all because they lost Tyreek Hill. And listen, I understand that Tyreek Hill is a phenomenal player. He's able to impact the game in so many ways, special teams, On offense, anytime he touches the football, he is a touchdown waiting to happen. But I think that for the people who think that Kansas City is going to miss the playoffs and they're just going to have this big fall off, I think they're being really disrespectful to Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes because those are the two main cogs for the success in Kansas City. As long as they have... Patrick Mahomes and the Big Red Machine, I don't have any concerns about Kansas City making it to the playoffs. Now, this offensive line still happens to be one of the best in the NFL. You're still going to have a very solid group of wide receivers. It's not like the Kansas City Chiefs have one of the worst wide receiving cores in the NFL. You sign Judas Schuster, who is one of the best slot receivers in the NFL. Very physical. He is going to bring really good run blocking to your run game. You also have MVS, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, who is a very good deep threat. Don't know how good he could be as a potential number one. But you also do have rookie Sky Moore and undrafted rookie free agent Justin Ross, who a lot of Chiefs fans are really excited about. And then you have Travis Kelsey. And Travis Kelsey pretty much was the number one wide receiver in Kansas City. And that may be a hot take to some people, but if you go and you look at the numbers, Travis Kelsey has received more targets than Tyreek Hill, and he has caught more passes than Tyreek Hill consistently. So for me personally... I don't think that Kansas City is going to have this giant fall off. And that's why, for me, my worst case scenario for Kansas City is 10 and 7. I cannot see this team losing more than seven games this year. If they win less than 10 games, I would be extremely shocked. And I'm willing to put money down that Kansas City is going to get to at least 10 wins because this team is just too talented for this giant fall off that a lot of people are predicting. The wide receiver position is a position that can be easily replaceable. I mean, the Pittsburgh Steelers have great wide receivers that come in and out consistently. You know, it's not about the receiver. It's about who's throwing the football. If you have an elite quarterback such as Patrick Mahomes, he can take an average to above average wide receiver and turn him into a Pro Bowl caliber wide receiver. Now, I'm not saying that he did that with Tyreek Hill, because Tyreek Hill was putting up numbers way before Patrick Mahomes became the starter for the Chiefs. All I'm saying is this. Yes, Tyreek Hill is a loss. 
But the Kansas City Chiefs have other ways to make up for that loss with the additions that they have made at wide receiver over the course of this offseason. I think that Juju Smith-Schuster is going to be really phenomenal in this offense. On top of that, you're going to have Miko Hartman, who potentially could end up breaking out and filling the role of Tyreek Hill. Now, he's not as explosive and as fast as Tyreek Hill is, but he's also one of the fastest players in the NFL, in my opinion. And with how good this offensive line is, Patrick Mahomes is still going to have pretty much all day to throw the football. And on top of that, you bring in Ronald Jones, so you're going to have the one-two punch of him and Clyde Edwards-Solaire. So I think that this offense is going to be better in some capacity without Tyreek Hill because there were a lot of times when Patrick Mahomes was forcing the football to Tyreek Hill. Just go back to the AFC Conference Championship game. There were several interceptions that... Patrick Mahomes threw when he was just trying to do too much and it was all predicated on trying to get the ball to Tyreek. So I think now with the fact that Tyreek is gone, you're going to have Patrick Mahomes now who's going to be a little bit more efficient with the football. He's not going to be trying to force things downfield to Tyreek Hill. He's going to be more willing to take what the defense gives him. Now that's just my assessment. Some of you guys may disagree with that, but I think that when you look at the numbers, and how Patrick Mahomes has played without Tyreek Hill, he's been really good. So I really can't see this team winning less than 10 games unless the defense just completely falls off and Kansas City's offense can't keep up with being able to outscore everybody. And that's really my biggest concern. My biggest concern when it comes to the Chiefs is this defense. Is the pass rush going to be there? Because outside of Chris Jones, you don't really have anybody who you can constantly depend on to give you a consistent pass rush. You don't have anybody on this defensive line who you can look at and say, oh yeah, man, like I trust him to give me at least nine, maybe 10 sacks. Now you're hoping that George Karloftis can be that guy right away from you as a rookie, but we don't know yet. So the secondary also is a big concern. Outside of Legereus Need. I don't really have any confidence in whoever's going to be the second cornerback outside of him. Is it going to be DeAndre Baker? You get what I'm saying? Like, it's just a lot of questions when it comes to the cornerback position and the pass rush of Kansas City. So, worst case scenario, 10-7, and seven, only because... I don't think it's going to be the offense. I think it could be their defense that holds them back from being able to win more games than 10. Now, my best case scenario is 13 and 4. If everything goes right for Kansas City and they're able to find a another guy on that defense who can provide a consistent pass rush out of Chris Jones, I think that's going to help out the cornerback position because then those guys aren't going to have to be in coverage for that long. And the back end of the secondary, when you look at safety, is still pretty good. You got Juan Thornhill and you signed Justin Reed, who is going to be replacing Tyran Matthew. Justin Reed has been one of the more underrated defensive backs in the NFL for over the last couple of years. Although he did have a pretty poor season last Last year with the Houston Texans, overall, he has put out a consistent body of work. So I think that he's going to have a bounce back year this year. On top of that, Steve Spagnola has been one of the better defensive coordinators in the NFL for over the last, what, two, three seasons. He has always found the way to get the most out of this defense. Now, sometimes the defense does have slow starts to the season, but normally they pick up steam around the middle portion of the year. So I think for Kansas City... With Steve Spagnola still remaining as your defensive coordinator, this defense should still be at least a top 16 defense. Now, offensively, if you win 13 games, that just means that Tyreek Hill wasn't that big of a loss anyway. That means that either Miko Hartman stepped up and became the player that we have all expected him to become when he was drafted out of Georgia a couple of years ago. You have Travis Kelsey still putting up godly numbers at the tight end position. Your offensive line is still really good. And then Patrick Mahomes is still being one of the best quarterbacks in the league and showing everybody that, hey, I don't need Tyreek Hill to prove to everybody that I'm still one of the most talented and one of the best quarterbacks in this league. You feel me? I just kind of think that it's dumb that people are really doubting Kansas City. Honestly, you get what I'm saying? Why do people 
underrate the value of having a great head coach having a great head coach can elevate you when you have a great head coach it doesn't matter who you lose because you have that next man up mentality so many people are just so enthralled and in love with the skill position in the NFL. And the skill position is one of the most replaceable positions in the NFL. Is a reason why positions like running back and wide receiver don't have a long, you know, a long-term range of success in the NFL. Because wide receiver play only really lasts you about maybe five years at best that you're going to get elite level play from that position. Okay, it's hard to find a elite level tight end that can be consistent for seven plus years. It's hard to find a consistent quarterback that can be great for your franchise and lead you to the postseason for a decade. It's hard to find a franchise level left tackle. There are other positions that are hard to replace than wide receiver. So I kind of think that, you know, 13 and 4 is going to be my best case scenario for Kansas City. My overall record prediction for the Chiefs this year is 11 and 6. And the reason why I have them losing six games and why I don't have them at 12 wins is because I don't trust the cornerback position. And I don't know if that pass rush is going to be there. Now, maybe they can trade for Robert Quinn or somebody like that, but. I just don't have a lot of confidence that this secondary is going to be all that great. I'm not worried about the back end. I'm particularly worried about the cornerback position. And a lot of the teams that they face this year are really good passing teams. I mean, you're facing the Arizona Cardinals and the LA Chargers to start the season off. The Arizona Cardinals are going to be a really good team on offense, not just when it comes to running the football, but now the fact that you're going to have Marquise Brown there. I think that he's going to be a solid replacement until DeAndre Hopkins comes back. So I think that you could have some problems with them. The LA Chargers, we already know what happens with this offense when it comes to the Chargers and how explosive they are with Justin Herbert. They're able to generate a lot of big plays. Mike Williams is coming off a career year. You also got to play the LA Raiders, well, the Las Vegas Raiders, the Tempe Buccaneers, the Buffalo Bills. I mean, for Kansas City, if you can't have a pass rush the first four or five games of the year, you could find yourself in a situation where you have to outscore everybody to win. And Kansas City has done that in the past, but are you going to be able to do it at a consistent level this season? That's where my questions are going to lie. So I don't really have concerns about the offense. I know that the offense is going to be able to put up points, but is this going to be an offense that's going to be able to be good enough to outscore everybody without Tyreek Hill? That's where my concern with losing Tyreek Hill is going to lie. Because when you had Tyreek Hill, you had somebody who was a threat to touch the football and take it to the house almost any time he got his hands on it. So without them now, you know, you're not going to have as many explosive big play touchdowns without them. You're going to have to be more efficient. So when you're going against, you know, the Raiders and the Buccaneers and Arizona and the Chargers teams that can put up points in bunches, that pass rush is going to have to be there. And I don't know if it's going to be consistent enough for Kansas City to be able to pull off a 12-win season. That's why I have them at 11-6. Last season... Outside of the Cincinnati Bengals, the Las Vegas Raiders were one of the biggest surprises in the NFL. This team made it to the postseason, won 10 games despite all the adversity that they had to face. I mean, they lost their head coach, you had the Henry Ruggs incident, and then they got ice cold during the middle portion of the year. And then late November, the month of December, they just were able to flip the switch and they got really hot. And I always tell people, you know, late November is where we start to see the pretenders separate themselves from the contenders. And for a while, it looked as if the Las Vegas Raiders were going to be a non-factor. And then they just got really, really hot late in the season when it mattered the most. And it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And the Raiders finished the season last year in 2021 out really strong. And by the way, they had a really competitive game against the Cincinnati Bengals in the wild card round. And if the ball would have bounced in a different direction, they might have been able to win that game. 
And by the way, it came down to what? The last play of the game, a goal line stand that ended up winning the game for Cincinnati. So for the Las Vegas Raiders, their fan base has a lot of optimism going into this season. You have a new head coach in Josh McDaniels, who is getting his second stint in the NFL as a head coach after, you know, his first one with the Denver Broncos didn't really go all that well. And this offense is going to be really explosive. I mean, you have a loaded group of weapons when it comes to the passing game. You traded for Devontae Adams, who is the best wide receiver in the NFL right now, in my opinion. You have Hunter Renfro, a.k.a. Third and Renfro, pretty much the best slot receiver in the game. You're going to have Darren Waller. Hopefully, he's able to stay fully healthy this season. And then you still do have Josh Jacobs at running back. And by the way, you have Patrick Graham as your defensive coordinator, who may be the best DC that you have had in over the last decade or so. So there is a lot of optimism if you are a Raiders fan. And my best case scenario for this team is 11-6. Derek Carr is really underappreciated. I think that he was pretty much 85, maybe 90% of the reason why the Las Vegas Raiders were able to make it into the playoffs. And a lot of people don't realize just how good Derek Carr is. Now you improve the wide receiver position. You give him somebody who has a lot of familiarity with him. Remember, Devontae Adams and both Derek Carr played at Fresno State together. So the chemistry is going to be there. Hopefully they get the timing and stuff right and they learn the offense and everything in time for the season. Maybe they could get out to a slow start having to learn the system and whatnot. But I do think that when you look at what this offense has from a skill position standpoint, this is one of the most talented offenses in the NFL. You look at the defense. The defense you bring in Chandler Jones, who could be an upgrade from Yannick Ngakwe. He's getting up there in age, but he's still putting up godly numbers. And with Max Crosby on the other side, this is one of the best pass rushing tandems in the NFL. Then you also have a defensive line that also should be pretty good against the run. Then you have Denzel Perryman, who is coming off a Pro Bowl caliber season. I'm... Not really sure who's going to be the other inside linebacker who lines up next to him. That's going to be a little bit of a concern for me. I think that the secondary isn't all that great. So for Las Vegas, I think I can't really see them winning more than 11 games this year. And the offensive line concerns me. But if the offensive line improves and it's way better than what it was last season, there's no doubt in my mind that Las Vegas could be a team that ends up not only winning 11 games, but they could be a sneaky team in the playoffs that could make a little bit of a Cinderella playoff run. But my worst case scenario for this team is 5-12. and 12. You see, the Raiders are one of those teams that has a extremely high floor, well, extremely high ceiling, and an extremely low floor. I mean, this offensive line is not good. And I've been arguing with Raiders fans all offseason about how this offensive line is going to perform. And I keep telling them, this is not a good offensive line. Just because you made it to the playoffs last year of this offensive line doesn't mean you're going to be able to do it again. And most likely, you're not. And the reason for that is because this division got better. People seem to forget that Their team isn't the only team that matters. People never really realize that, yeah, my team got better, but so did all the other teams in the division. The Chargers now have Khalil Mack now. You're going to have to deal with him and Joey Bosa. Is Alex Leatherwood going to be able to hold on and improve this season? Or is he going to end up proving to be a bust? And then on top of that, you do bring back Denzel Good, but is he really going to be that big of an addition that he's just going to drastically improve the offensive line with him coming back fully healthy? I don't really think that. Because when you look at how Denzel Good has performed over the last couple of years, he's been all right, but he hasn't really been anything great or outstanding. And then the fact that you're hoping that Alex Leatherwood is going to develop this year, I think it's kind of just riskful thinking. 
So for the Raiders, their offensive line is a giant concern. And I can bet money that if this offensive line performs the way that it did last season, this year, they're not going to make it to the playoffs. Because this division is just way too tough to win or have a lot of success in if you can't hold your own on the line of scrimmage. And for the Las Vegas Raiders, that is a big concern that I have. What's the point of trading for Devontae Adams if you're not going to give Derek Carr enough time to throw him the football? Now, the secondary also is a big concern of mine as well. I like Trayvon Morag, but outside of him, don't really have a lot of confidence in anybody else. I do like Mullen a lot. However, can you stay healthy? And when he is healthy, he's above average at best. So you don't really have a great secondary outside of slot cornerback Nate Hobbs, who had a fantastic rookie season. That's about the only person I really trust. Jonathan Abrams is really just great in run support. He's not really all that great in coverage. So for the Las Vegas Raiders, although you do have defensive coordinator Patrick Graham, I don't think that this defense is going to be all that great right away. And former New York Giants players have said this about Patrick Graham's defense, that it's a learning curve to it. It's a really hard-to-learn defense because there are a lot of nuances in it. There are a lot of details that are implemented in this defense that takes certain players a while to grasp. So my record prediction for the Raiders this season is 6-11. and 11. I don't think that this is going to be the year that the Raiders go off. I think their offense is going to be really good, but overall how they're going to perform as a team, I think they're only going to win six games. And you're probably going to say if you're a Raiders fan, man, JT, we had so much success last year because of our offensive line not being great. We still made it to the playoffs. That was last year, ladies and gentlemen. Are we just going to ignore the fact that the Chargers got better? Are we just going to ignore the fact that the Chiefs are still the Kansas City Chiefs, even if they did lose Tyreek Hill? What about the Denver Broncos? They got better also. And there's no way that you're going to be able to win a tough division with this bad of an offensive line. Cincinnati did it because the AFC North, Baltimore had the majority of their starters on IR before the season even started. You have the Pittsburgh Steelers who were not all that great. And the Cleveland Browns were a disappointment last season. Plus, they had a crippled Baker Mayfield at quarterback. So, you have to take everything into context. There's not going to be another Cincinnati. What Cincinnati did last year is the equivalent to somebody winning the lottery. You have a low chance of being able to do it again. And for the Las Vegas Raiders, even though I do have confidence in what Josh McDaniels can be as a head coach this go-around in Las Vegas... I do think that this could be a season where Las Vegas ends up having a losing season. And I know Raiders fans are going to be upset about that. Because I understand that you had a lot of success last year given the variables. Given the fact that your offensive line wasn't that great. But at the same time, you have to understand that this division has gotten better. And there aren't a lot of teams that can make it far in a tough division if you can't handle yourself on the line of scrimmage football is still a game that is won and lost in the trenches and if you can't win the battle up front then nine times out of ten you're gonna lose so this is my record prediction for the las vegas raiders i have them at six and eleven like i said i could see them having 11 wins this season if the offensive line improves but i don't really have a lot of confidence that that offensive line is going to improve this season The Los Angeles Chargers last season, I'm not going to lie. They let me down. Before the season started in 2021, I had the Chargers as a playoff lock, almost a dark horse Super Bowl contender. And yet they went 9-8 and and they finished in third place in the AFC West division. Now, the reason why their season went the way that it did last year was, one, because they dealt with a good amount of injuries on the defensive side of the football, and two... They played down the competition. A good example of that was the loss against the Houston Texans. So this year, this is a better football team than what they were going into last season. The offensive line is going to be really good. Mine is right tackle. This is a phenomenal offensive line that the Chargers are going to have. 
On defense, you trade for Khalil Mack. You're going to be pairing him up with Joey Bosa. That's going to end up being one of the best pass rushing duos in the NFL. You have Asante Samuel Jr. going into year two, coming off a really good rookie season. You're going to be pairing him up with J.C. Jackson, who was locked down for New England last season. So this defense is going to be phenomenal, at least it should be when you look at it on paper. You have Duran James, who is one of the best football players in the NFL. Not one of the best defensive players in the NFL. One of the best football players in the NFL. There isn't a player in the NFL that can do so much and mean so much to his team as Duran James. So I think when you look at the Chargers, their best case scenario for me is 13-4. and four. I was really close to saying 14 and 3, but the reason why I have them at 13 and 4 is simply for the fact that I think that linebacker could cost them. Now, I don't know what it is with Brandon Staley. Maybe he just doesn't care about the linebacker position. Maybe it isn't really a big piece of his defense because when he was the defensive coordinator for the Rams, the linebacker play there wasn't really all that great. So hopefully, maybe Kenneth Murray ends up developing and having a strong season and he ends up living up to his first round draft status so if he ends up playing up to that this defense definitely could end up being times four as good as what it looks on paper because you already have a really good defensive line you already have a pretty good secondary your only weakness is the linebacker position so if Kenneth Murray can give you at least decent maybe above average play that could make this defense maybe end up being a top five unit so the offense you have a great offensive line left tackle left guard center right guard all that is really great your only weakness is right tackle so if you can get some okay right tackle play that's going to be a bonus and we already know just how talented this wide receiver group is you got keenan Allen. Really don't understand why people don't think he's a top 10 wide receiver in the league, but I've already ranted about that enough. You have Mike Williams coming off a breakout season. He has a fresh new contract extension. Then you have Austin Eckler, who is one of the best scat backs in the league. And then we already know about the young gun that is Justin Herbert. So, I mean, this offense is absolutely loaded. This team is absolutely loaded. This is one of the most talented teams in the NFL. Not just in the AFC, but in the NFL. If you were to rank every team's roster based off talent, I think that the Chargers would probably be in the top seven, maybe top six of that. So this team has all of the pieces to not only have the potential of being able to get the number one overall seed in the AFC when it comes to the playoff race, but maybe they could end up making a deep run in the playoff and maybe end up becoming a Super Bowl contender. And I saw an article on Bleach Report that said what teams are playoff teams but not Super Bowl contenders and the Chargers were listed in that article. And I was really a little bit taken back by that because outside of linebacker and right tackle, this team doesn't really have any big weaknesses. So if this team can get, you know, at least decent play from the right tackle and linebacker spots, this is a team that's going to end up being one of the best in the NFL this season. Now, my worst case scenario for the Chargers is 8-9. and nine, And I really can't see them winning no less than eight games if they lose more than nine games i think brandon staley without a doubt is going to be the first thing cooking and they're going to be bringing in somebody else maybe it could be sean payton but with the talent that the chargers have i really can't see them missing the playoffs if they can't even win nine games then i mean what are we doing you get what i'm saying it's really hard to disappoint and not make it into the postseason when you have a team that has so much talent. And even though the NFL isn't all about talent, you also have to have a really good coach. We've seen several examples of that throughout over the last couple of years. A good one would be Jason Garrett with the Dallas Cowboys. He has so much talent, but yet they always underachieve. So with Brandon Staley last season, this was somebody who took a lot of risk, a lot of risk. This was somebody who was super aggressive when it came to attempting to move the chains and fourth down situations and I love it but at the same time 
It also costed the LA Chargers some games as well, which is another reason why they also played down the competition. So for the LA Chargers, you have to wonder, is the risk taking going to be a factor this season? Is right tackle going to end up holding the Chargers back? What about linebacker? Linebacker is going to be really really big for the Chargers this season because it's not all that great from a talent standpoint I mean you do have Kenneth Murray and remind you that he was a first round pick and you can make all the excuses in the world for him saying that he was injured and whatnot listen every single NFL player by the time we get to week seven or week eight of the season is injured I don't think there's no NFL player that goes through a whole entire season playing at 100 percent it just doesn't really happen so for Kenneth Murray you know, if he ends up not really being all that great and the linebacker play really isn't all that great, then I think that, you know, maybe that could be a factor into the Chargers only having eight wins. But it's really hard for me to see the Chargers having this season where they don't get into the postseason. That's why my record prediction for them is 10 and 7. The reason why I have them at 10 wins and maybe not a little bit higher is simply for the fact that this division is tough and I do think that they're going to split with everybody. I don't really think there's going to be a team that they're going to just mop the floor with, but I think that they could be a team that gets into the wild card and then they end up having a couple of upsets and then boom, you see them in the AFC championship game. So I think that Brandon Staley, I do have a lot of confidence in him as the head coach. I like how he approaches the game. He's somebody who isn't afraid to take risk. And oftentimes when you're trying to win or not just trying to win in the NFL, but when you're trying to be successful, you have to take risk. And the people who are the most successful in life, they took risks. They gambled. And for Brandon Staley, I like the fact that he's willing to gamble. Even if it may cost him some games, he never holds back on decision. I love that. I love coaches that are in fourth and two, fourth and three, and they don't kick field goals. They try to get the first down and keep the drive alive. So for Brandon Staley... I think that's the reason why I have so much confidence in him. I just love the fact that he's aggressive. Sometimes you roll the dice and you don't get the number that you want. And sometimes you roll the dice and it plays out in your favor. So I think more times than not this season, his gamble is going to play off. I think that this defense is going to be probably the most improved unit in the NFL and offensively they should pick off where they left off last last season and be even better so I had them at 10 and 7 you look at their schedule now this division is already pretty tough but their schedule honestly outside of the AFC West is not that difficult I mean you get to play Jacksonville Houston you got to play the Cleveland Browns. You don't know what's going to happen if Deshaun Watson is going to be available for that game or not. Seattle, Atlanta, back to back. And you play Atlanta coming off a bye. So you just look at the Chargers. Their schedule isn't all that tough until the later portion of the season where you have to play Kansas City, Arizona, Las Vegas. And remind you that they're playing both those Las Vegas and Arizona games on the road and back-to-back -back weeks. Then you have to play Miami, Tennessee, Indianapolis, the Rams, and Denver to close out the year. And that's where things can get really challenging. But overall, I think that they should be able to win 10 games. That's going to be my record prediction for the Los Angeles Chargers. So this is it for my AFC West 2022 record predictions. I appreciate you guys for listening to this episode of the JT Sports Podcast. Drop your record predictions for each team in this division down in the comment section down below. Also, make sure that you check out the JT Sports Podcast available on all podcasting platforms. Leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed. And I will see you guys with another episode of the JT Sports Podcast.